going to uh, be looking at rendering animal flesh. Now, I have to admit, prior to doing this project that I'm working on, of which you will get to see another few free previews, so uh, lucky you, I had not really spent much time drawing wildlife. I even told myself on the onset of uh, writing this particular project that I wasn't going to put animals in it because that was just so, so a native thing to do and have animals running all around. And I, I really didn't want to have that. <laughs> and I just didn't want it to seem like it was stereotypical. But as soon as the writing started uh, happening for, for real and the whole thing was you know, for, you know, formatting in my head, in come the animals. And totally unbidden by me, but it, it turned out to be probably the best thing ever. And now the animals portion of, uh, or the, the animal par um, parts of, of the story are some of my favorite things in the book. And um, so this kind of took a bit to kind of step back and go, all right, we've got to learn how to draw animals here. And um, in, in some cases, drawing them in uh, fantastic uh, ways. So we're going to look at a few things here and I'll show you initially the uh, sketches and then what the finished product uh, looks like. And then we will conclude that with um, a brief uh, uh, pictorial of some of the other animal creatures uh, that you will see and uh, things that I had to uh, literally sit down and watch the creatures in front of me, and um, which was better <laughs> easily said than done. So here we go. So first, first thing is, in the writing, there is a creature of native myth and lore, which apparently seems to be continent-wide. And this is a gigantic creature called, well actually it depends on where you, where you are, but I just called it the moose whale, or the whale moose. And it's a moose that's whale-sized, and um, our heroes get eaten by it. <laughs> because basically, why not? So here's the sketch that I had originally had uh, done of it. I also decided that, you know, here we're gonna put that little weird little beard thing that all moose have. And of course the snub nose. But what distinguished this drawing from a regular moose, as you can see here, is that I have made the uh, the antlers kind of uh, more infused to the uh, sides that they had than sticking out and with a lot of little protrusions coming out of it and uh, a little shot of our duo in the water. So that was that was the sketch. I was pretty, I, I was pretty happy with it right on the onset. So uh, the only thing was is that uh, in terms of the actual artwork uh, or the production art, that it wasn't big enough and we had to get it a little bit bigger so that kind of necessitated a, another sketch. I liked it because it almost kind of looked sort of dragon-esque and at the time you know Game of Thrones and the dragon stuff was happening so I went online and started looking up some pictures of moose and tried to figure out where the uh, musculature occurs on their face so when I render the hair, all of that looks correct, even though this whole back piece here with the uh, with the antlers is um, that's fan you know that's a fantastic uh, element. So I can you know pretty much do what I want there, but um, still kind of use you know some of the uh, so the elements that are you'd see in an actual moose. You know, in the in the story, the two my my two characters K and T spend most of their time in another realm trying not to get eaten. So here they are liberated from that environment, making it back to earth, so, so, you know, supposedly safe and sound, and yet within the first minute of getting back here, they're eaten by this thing. So here's the finished production artwork. Now once again, paying attention to where the highlights are, these bits here kind of help 
delineate where the um, muscles and the uh, bones or the skeletal structure of this creature are underneath the fur. Now, the whole thrust is this this particular creature is moving upward. So also to convey that, you know, the beard I decided, decided had to move back this way. And then of course with the water um, slopping back in this direction and pouring off the antlers on that side, uh, that helps with movement. I decided on a little uh, element of the eyes right here that the eye is kind of rolling up into the back of the head. That is something actually that sharks do when they jump out of the water, I guess to protect the, uh, the uh, iris and cornea, the, their eyes roll up inside. So I thought that was a cool little detail to add. And the shot itself is at a very kind of um, Dutch angle. So um, the horizon line is kind of jutting off of this uh, near to 50 degree angle. And um, you can see the, the background here. Uh, and then uh, off into the distance you have its tail. This is something that, one of those moments in time where you go, this is something I didn't plan. I gave it a two or a split tail, and I wasn't sure why, but I thought, you know, why not do something a little different here? And then I ran across a book about Anishinaabe legend and lore and stuff like that. And sure enough, as I opened the book for the first time and flipped randomly to the center of the book, bam, there is a pictoglyphic piece of art that showed this horned water monster that had a split tail. I sat and I stared at that for about 30 seconds, almost in disbelief, that it's something that um, I, I can't explain it, um, but it was exactly, you know, it, it, it supported what, you know, what I had done. And um, so when you get those moments, you know, savor those little moments in your artistic life, because those things, who knows what it is, you know, everyone always says that all creativity, words and pictures are floating in this, uh, you know, this ephemera above you and you, if you open your mind to it, or like natives say, when we call the spirit, we're asking for that to come down. So I was very blown away by that and humbled by it, that that little piece of information somehow made its way to me. And um, then, then finding out that it was absolutely, you know, perfect in terms of this creature. So we will look at one more thing here. Earlier in this part of the book, when K and T have not yet gotten out of that nether world, uh, all the creatures in there are hybrids, encompassing one, two, or three more animal types. Now that uh, turns out to be something very common in uh, native myth and lore storytelling. And um, you always hear of uh, the otter people or spider woman, and um, the, that there's, you know, human and uh, animal uh, hybridization going on or two separate other animals. Um, so this, this thing, this is a splash page, much like the whale moose um, splash page, where a giant elephant-sized boar is bearing down on K and T. And um, so I, I decided that uh, it would be initially just sort of more pig-like, and then um, after afterwards uh, decided, you know, that was the way to go. Uh, so this initial sketch is kind of um, elephantine or mammoth, but it was without hair, and. As soon as I did this, I realized no, I didn't want. I didn't want that. It should look like an elephant. Why I don't know, but I just kind of. I liked it, but I realized that I wanted a creature that was more uh, North American. So I decided, well, the boar would fit that bill, and I don't have to do much to change the drawing overall. 
So I didn't really want to change any of the, uh, the position of the animal or uh, anything like that. Also, you see here that the, the feet aren't exactly like you'd see on an elephant. You know, these front appendages definitely have a non-elephant or non-boar-like uh, structure to them. So here's, we're getting the David Lean shot here of the whole thing, of this piece. So snout goes in, I decide to uh, segment the tusks and give it the razor back, <laughs> you know, a punk rock mohawk <laughs> on it. That I liked, I, I thought was a, a cool little thing, you know, a nod to uh, Sid Vicious. And, um, <clears throat> Here, you know, we, we just, I decided that we're going to do a lot of shading in on the musculature. Um, that gives it dimension and mass. And um, a whole bunch of other, you know, attendant creatures. These uh, human-sized wasp. Some weird tree, tree guy. I don't know what that is. Um, and what looks like kind of like a water buffalo and slash... Tyrannosaurus Rex, um, but I, I kind of, like I said, everything was hybridized. When I originally thought of the creatures here, I was actually drawing them more to, they look more like demons, and um, I decided, no, I didn't want it to kind of get out of the, you know, Judeo-Christian ethic, so was, I had to kind of sit down and figure out, story-wise, you know, what was going to happen here. I uh, didn't, you know, I could have put in way more creatures and I've actually tried to resist doing that just because uh, this was enough. So we're going to do a quickie sketch of what has now become one of the most important animal characters in this book. And how it happened, I don't know. Like I said, it kind of just, I just kind of bashed in to the story and I have to deal with it later. <laughs> so, in this case, it is a raven who um, starts sort of a, in a supporting character, become, but becomes actually really quite uh, formative in the overall storytelling. And um, I would hope that at some point in time, this 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 raven. You could probably take all of the story bits of it and lift it right out of the book and have it as its own separate standalone story. And it's a, it would be a great story for kids in terms of like um, perseverance, believing in yourself, and um, you know, just accepting uh, who you are. A group of ravens is known as a unkindness. Not sure that's entirely deserved. There are other designations I thought maybe were a little better. Like a storm of ravens, a nightfall of ravens, or a darkening. Now one thing I've learned about ravens is that most, or if not all, when they're born, they have blue eyes. And then when they turn to maturity, those eyes go to a chestnut brown. So the blue eye aspect lends itself to a number of different stories that we tell in the uh, myths. When I was um, living in Vancouver, I got to witness a, a number of extremely bizarre behaviors that these these birds do and let me tell you one of them is that they are art critics i was sitting at a picnic table at third beach trying to decide what the name of this book should be and i thought i had it so i'm sitting there and i'm finishing the sketch up and then i started uh doing the um, finished pencils on it, and um, there was a raven sitting in the grass, 
about 20 feet in front of me and he lifts off and I just happened to look up just in time and he flew right over my head and took an absolutely massive crap all over my drawing. I was wearing a black t-shirt and I didn't have a hat on or anything like that. So first I'm like, oh no, oh you, ah, and you know, checked out. It turns out not nothing. I even took my shirt off and looked at it. There was nothing on my back, nothing on the shoulders. Totally missed me completely. But the drawing and the logo was covered perfectly right down to every millimeter of it. You couldn't even see it. <laughs> so I took that as a sign that that wasn't the name of the comic book. So I abandoned it right there. Now they're all seen as pretty much all the way around as tricksters. And I wouldn't refute that, but I also have seen them do things that don't seem to be very bird-like. Now the beaks are longer on a raven than say another member of the blackbird family, in this case the crow. They don't really seem to get along as far as I, I could tell. Now when it came down to figuring out how to render these creatures, I mean, hey, yeah, the online resources are in the millions, so, you know, there's, you could definitely start there. There's a lot of great books in the library, which is even better. I was lucky that I was able to observe ravens and other blackbirds and other creatures in natural settings. I just sit there and sketch them. And I think that's a little bit of a more holistic now, someone might look at this drawing and say, this is the bird lifting off, or it could be landing. And if it was a white raven, we could just leave it like that. But we're not, so feathers. Same thing I, sh I was indicating with um, the moose whales, fur, uh, or hair. As it's, if it's moving and you want to convey that motion subtly, I'm not a fan of speed lines. I know in a lot of anime, it's half the artwork is speed lines. And I'm not a fan of it. I think, I think if you could do, do the, a limited amount of it, then that's great. But um, uh, I like to use the actual artwork indicating the direction that things are flowing. So I am, just going to choose a light source. We'll say it's back here somewhere, maybe at uh, near to this, I don't know, maybe 10 o'clock in the morning from behind it. Around the same time that that bird just crapped all over my drawing. Some of the other birds that make their way into the story initially, the Red Bill Cormorant I used to go down to Burrard Landing in Vancouver and there's cormorants all over the place. I was looking at them at a distance, so it was kind of hard to gauge how big they were until one landed near me and it was quite large, much larger than I thought. But he sat there just long enough to me to get a quick sketch in. That sketch turned out to be the panel that I used in the book almost completely. It was almost like he was posing for it. <laughs> so, who am I? You're wonderful, you're beautiful. Now give me the left side. These are extremely intelligent animals. And I shouldn't even call them. Apparently we're not even supposed to call them animals anymore because um, they've determined that 
on an episode of The Nature of Things with David Suzuki, that studies have gone into determining how intelligent these things really are, and they exceeded everything that we ever thought of them. They tell stories. Mother passes down wisdom to her children. Those children pass down that. So that's culture. So we really can't call them animals. I was in Canmore. It's kind of right on the Alberta BC border in the mountains. And we were just taking a brief stop, getting a coffee and at this little place. And I looked up on this traffic light and um, I was in the parking lot and a very large raven kind of a lit on top of it. And I go, wow, that's a big boy. Wow, look at him. And um, uh, the missus shows up right after that and uh, sits next to him and they're just kind of checking out the scene and I was watching them and then she kind of leans in and puts her head very gently on his shoulder and he kind of nuzzles into her and then at the side of the beaks they started moving their beaks back and forth against one another like this and I was watching it and I'm going are they kissing? because <laughs> it just this was very, it's not it's a behavior I'd not seen them do yet. So um, I'd learned in that um, David Suzuki special that along their sides of their beaks, all along the lip, there are these micro fine little hairs. And they deliver sensation. And I guess in this case, very pleasurable sensation so they, yeah, they snog. They also do something else that I thought was extremely human and unfortunate. And that is, uh, they do have a bit of a hierarchical side to them, maybe even borderline prejudice. My friend Ralph and I would feed them in Stanley Park. We became very aware of the fact that one of them that had a kind of a club foot Another one whose beak was slightly malformed. The other ones would not allow them to feed before they did. And they would beat them up, try to shoo them off. So one of us would feed the main group and the other of us would kind of secretly feed the, the uh, unique ones. Actually, that's one of the things I do miss now that I'm living in Toronto. Um, I almost never see any blackbirds anymore. Things to just kind of remember that, you know, on the, on the wings, feathers are, of course, larger, and so they can encompass uh, a uh, area of the body that you can easily just kind of fill in with just doing solids. Um, but all around the head and the eyes, the uh, feathers there are much, much finer, especially right here on the forehead. There is like a super tiny little area of feathers. Um, were this a little larger, I would have included that detail. And as they grow older, gray starts to show up in places. I've noticed that some will do it on the back of the head or even on fringe areas of the wings, but notably on the beard area, just underneath the uh, bottom part of the beak. Um, I've seen some, I guess they're the elders, and they have these little white tufts. All right, here we go. This is, I shouldn't say there's actually one Raven character, this is actually about three of them. And um, they all show up at um, periods of the, in the story. And it all moves towards a absolutely monumental amount of them <laughs> while they're trying to defeat a very dark scourge and they're needed so um 
This mass of this murder of crows has to come in. It's more than that, it's a cyclone of them. And it's one of my favorite bits for, as far as the animal uh, part of the, of the uh, comic is concerned. I don't even think there's gonna be a single human in that, <laughs> in that uh, particular issue. And you know, quite honestly, nobody will miss them because this particular story, in terms of what they do, is just, you'll love it, you'll love it.